topic for this evening happens to be Arabs and Israel conflict or conciliation. Is the subject of this booklet. I published quarter million of these. I have been giving them out. And I have been offering to our PLO brethren. I said, come on, how many do you want in Washington? How many do you want in... How many? How many? But somehow, I don't know. Uh, they have not been very, very enthusiastic in handling this book. I don't know why. But this booklet I published quarter million first print. The topic. How does it come about? Arabs and Israel, conflict or conciliation. That topic, that subject, that construction of the topic. How does it come about? Well, it happened to me one morning at the height of the Israeli Blitzkrieg. You know that lightning war? Hitler had Blitzkrieg into Poland, into France, into Russia. That Blitzkrieg, you know, Hitler. That Blitzkrieg that the Jews applied in, in, in the Lebanon in 1982. At the height of that Blitzkrieg, I get a phone call from the University of Natal, a professor, professor Mason, head of the Department of Law. He phones me and says, look, the Jewish students at the university, they are inviting the Israeli Council General in South Africa to come and speak to the students about Palestine. And uh, would like to know from you whether you would also be prepared to participate they like to have, they say, it's not fair, only the Jew has his say. We want also a point of view of the Muslims. Would you be prepared to come? I said, yes. So, how do you suggest that we advertise this topic? So, it occurred to me, I said, look, pros, the pros and cons of Israel. Oh, it's says, beautiful. The pros and cons, the for and against. He is for, I am against, we discuss this. And let the students go home and think for themselves. It says, beautiful, beautiful. Right. A few days later, he comes back to me. He says, no, the Jews, they say they don't like the topic. They don't like your topic. Simple, neutral, pros and cons of Israel. He said, they say you must, Arabs and Israel, conflict or conciliation. I said, agreed. Now, there's a catch. There's a catch in the title. The Jews are very ingenious. They have always been. I don't know whether you know. Allah Ta'ala describes the Jews in the Quran, the progenitor of the Jews, Hazrat Isaq alayhi salam. But before that, Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam, the birth of Ismail alayhi salam. Allah Ta'ala gives the good news to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam and he says, I promise you a son, he will be Ghulam and Halima. Ismail will be Ghulam and Halima, humble, submissive fellow. And the second time the news is given to him, 13 years later, about the birth of Ishaq alayhi salam, he said, Ghulam and Alima, a knowledgeable fellow, a highly intellectual fellow. You think Allah is just trying to rhyme it? Ghulam and Halima, Ghulam and Alima. He's trying to just rhyme it for you? No, no, no. There's something in it. When he says Ghulam and Halima, look at the Arabs. <laughs> Despite all their barbarism. You know, of the pre-Islamic Arabs. Hmm? But they had this quality. When you come right with him, you accept him, he will give his life for you. He is humble, submissive. The true salt of the earth. And the Jew, you see, Ghulam and Alima, highly intellectual. He is always catching us out. He is always catching us out. You enter into a treaty, that resolution was a 242 or whatever it is, United Nations. Man, he's got you. Anything else, he's got you. The intellect. Intellect. Highly intellectual, even today. They are the leaders. Allah has made them so. So, highly intellectual people. They were so also in the time of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. Again and again, they came to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, in the Bible, in their Bible it says. They come to him, they said, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, Maulana, Sheikh, Imam, Maulana, Rabbi. Master, we caught this woman in the act, act of adultery. What must we do to her? They caught the woman in the act. Where is the man? 
You caught the woman in the act. What was she doing? Where was the man? No, no, the man is not there. It's this woman. They want to catch him out. If he says, according to the law of Moses, in the book of Leviticus, in the Bible, it says, the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. That's the verdict of the man of God. Stone the woman to death. And the man, but he's not there. And the man must be stoned to death. And adultery was not a capital crime in the Roman Empire. So, they would stone this woman to death. And if they were caught out, he said, why did you kill this woman? Instead of a Messiah says so. Now he's in conflict with the government. If he says, let her go, then he says, look, this is not a man of God. Because the Torah says that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to a death. Either way he loses. Heads I win, tails you lose. Masters, sir. geniuses. But Jesus is also a Jew. He's also a Jew. Hmm? Beautifully, he solves the problem. Beautifully. He says, let him who is free from, free from sin cast the first stone. And he turned the tables on them. But now, this is the genius of the Jew. Heads I win, tails you lose. Either way. I can give you dozens of examples from the Bible. How they confronted Jesus again and again. Master, what must you do? Master, they know the answer. Master, must we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Must we pay taxes or not? If he says pay taxes, then they say, look, this is not the Messiah we are waiting for. He is the stooge of the government. You see? Huh? He can't be the Messiah. Rejected. If he says don't pay, they won't pay. If they are caught, he says, why didn't you pay your taxes? He says, well, Messiah says so. He's in conflict with the government. Either way, he loses. Heads I win, tails you lose. Same. Conflict or conciliation. What do you want? You Muslims, what do you want? Come on, come on, come on. What will you have? Conflict? To the audiences, you see, these are troublemakers. The terrorists. You know? <laughs> the fundamental. You see, they want trouble. They want to fight. We want peace. They want war. In the eyes of the audience, never mind how right you are, you are already lost. This is conciliation. This is then why are you throwing stones? Huh? Why are you throwing stones? Either way you are caught. Heads I win, tails you lose. But I said, okay. We want an opportunity to have our message delivered. So Alhamdulillah, we accepted the title Arabs and Israel, Conflict of Conciliation. And with Dr. Lottem of the Israeli Embassy in South Africa, we had a debate. It was... A great debate. But something happened to the video. You see, we had the first time we bought this camera, and no experience, and we had our camera put there, and behind the speakers there was a huge curtain from the ceiling to, to the bottom, and it was flapping in the air, and I don't know whether you people know, the camera also does the same. You know, when, when the, the light is Shining and mm, 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 the camera is also doing that. It spoiled the film, you see. It didn't produce well. So we couldn't market the film. However, <coughs> the topic. Arabs in Israel, conflict or conciliation. Now I want to read to you a statement made by a Jew. An Austrian-German Jew, Leopold Weiss. He was a reporter for the German newspaper Frankfurter Zeitung. In 1922, he goes to Jerusalem. And the Jews had a gathering, private gathering. Dr. Weizmann was the head. Ben Gurion was there. And this other, Ben Begin and all. They were all young men. They were all there. And they were planning on the map. A map of Palestine was laid out. And Weizmann was saying that now we'll take this like that. And this is how we'll take this place. And so after listening to all this, this young Jew, he was 22 years old, a reporter for this newspaper. He said, but what about the Arabs? So Weizmann said, so what about the Arabs? He says, you know, there are a majority in the country. So Weizmann says, there won't be majority for long. There won't be majority for long. So he says, now, it struck him that these people... You know, they want to share out a people's land. They are there, they are living there, and they rob them of their land. So he said, he's saying, in his later on, he writes a book and he says, How was it possible? I wondered, how was it possible for a people endowed with so much creative intelligence as the Jews? He's a Jew himself. 
There is no doubt about it. So much creative intelligence as the Jews to think of the Zionist Arab conflict in Jewish terms alone. Did they not realize that the problem of the Jews in Palestine could in the long run be solved only through friendly cooperation with the Arabs? Didn't they realize that? Were they so hopelessly blind to the painful future which their policy must bring to the struggles, bitterness and the hatred to which the Jewish island, even if temporarily successful, would forever remain exposed in the midst of a hostile Arab sea. And how strange, I thought, this young Jew says, that a nation which had suffered so many wrongs in the course of its long and sorrowful diaspora dispersion was now in single-minded pursuit of its own goal, ready to inflict a grievous wrong on another nation, and a nation too that was innocent of all that past Jewish suffering. Such a phenomena, I knew, was not unknown to history. But it made me, nonetheless, very sad to see it enacted before my eyes. How does it happen that such a highly intellectual community, wallah they are, that they can think so selfishly and so brutally what Hitler had done to them, now they are prepared to do to another nation and who were not responsible for their sufferings. How is it possible? It is possible. People can be brainwashed. You can be brainwashed. We all can be brainwashed. I know the Americans don't like the term brainwashing. Brainwashed. They say programmed. We all can be programmed. See? I was corrected in my first trip to America. I was telling the, the, the audience in Berkeley University, said, you have been brainwashed. So one young man stood up and says, no, not brainwashed, programmed. I said, sorry, from now on, you programmed, programmed. Now people can be programmed. Now I give you my experience. How people can be programmed. And how they can be reprogrammed. I happen to work for Jews. I'm not standing here before you because the Jews are paying me. Wallah, no Jews pays me anything. I happened to work for Jews in a furniture shop as a dispatch clerk. One day, my boss calls me. He says, "Did that?" No, that's that's how he was. Did that? I was a dispatch clerk. That was the highest a black man could reach in the establishment, but it was very low compared to the the white workers. That position of mine, very low, but the highest that a black man can reach in the. In that apartheid system, white system in South Africa, highest I could reach. So as a that I have a Jewish couple from the Argentina. I would like to take them to the Indian area. Like the Kasba, you know, the Indian area. And give them some Indian food. What would you suggest? So I said, you see Mr. Beer, that's his name. Beer Brothers, a very big firm. There are over 125 establishments in South Africa at the present moment. A multi-million dollar or run establishment. So, I said, look, the only thing I can think of is there is a hotel here in Durban called Goodwill Lounge. But, uh, I mean, suitable for the whites to go to. But I said, the only thing Indian about this lounge is the curry powder they put into the curry. Otherwise, it's just like any other Western restaurant. But I said, why don't you come to my house? And I will give you what we eat. And I'll play some Indian music in the background. You know, while you're eating. <laughs> so, give you that Indian atmosphere. Then I'll take you to the mosque. And you'll watch the Muslim at prayer. And perhaps that will give you an idea of the Indians in Durban. Your, your visitors. Says, did that? It's a very good idea. But I'll have to confirm it with my wife. You know, the Westerner, he can't do anything without consulting his wife. He says, quite all right. Quite all right. Next morning, he calls me again. He says, did that. My wife is agreeable. And he took out three pounds. It was a lot of money. It was a lot of money those days. He took out three pounds and he gave it to me. I said, no, no, it's quite all right. I said, you know, I can't afford it. I said, no, no, did that. It'll help you. It was a great help. <laughs> no, it was a great help. No, no, you don't know. 19, around 1950, three pounds was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. So we made an appointment. It says, eight o'clock or a certain time like that. I said, you come along to this place in Queen Street, Durban, in the center of the town, and I'll be waiting for you. So he came, Mr. and Mrs. Beer, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Daniels, 
of a manufacturing firm in Durban and this couple from the Argentina. Six. Three pairs. Husband and wife, husband and wife, husband and wife. So I welcomed them, took them home and we sat down to eat and little chat. Uh, said so this sir is the unleavened bread of the Jews. Our roti. Unleavened bread. Unleavened means without yeast. Unleavened bread of the Jews. And they enjoyed the food. As soon as we finished eating, I was about about 200 meters away from the Juma Masjid, the largest mos mosque in the southern hemisphere, my residence. So we could hear the azan, the isha. So I'm, we are listening to the azan, the mosque. I said, you hear somebody calling, sir? He said, yes. You know what he's saying? He says, no. So he's saying, bismillah. So Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He's saying, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. He repeats it four times. He continues, the muazzin continues. Said, I bear witness that there is no other object to worship but Allah. He is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. Said, I bear witness. I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I said, if you accept these two fundamentals, that there is but one God and Muhammad is his messenger. What is the message? So, Hayya ala salat, he says, come to prayer. Hayya ala salat, he says, come to prayer. Hayya ala falah, he says, come to success. Because this is real success. If you want to be successful, there is no other way. That you hearken to the commandments of God and be charitable to your fellow human beings. Then he winds up the call by saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is still the greatest, Allah is still the greatest. Whether you come or you don't come. You will not going to lower him in his exaltation, in his majesty, in his glory, he still remains supreme. And the final words of warning the Muazzin gives, say, La ilaha illallah, that there is no other object of worship but Allah. You can keep on worshipping your man gods, your women gods, your money gods, but remember this, that the only one who deserves to be worshipped is him. This is the national anthem of the Muslims, wherever they live. And when a Muslim hears it, he can hearken to the call. He does not have to ask who is ringing the bell, is an RC or a DRC. In my country it means, RC means Roman Catholic and DRC means the Dutch Reformed Church. You don't have to ask who is ringing the bell, you hearken to the call and you respond. And the azan also got finished side by side with my explanation. The azan concluded. So I'm suggesting, Mr. Beer, if you like, we can go down and watch the Muslim at prayer. I had already offered him that. He said, will we be allowed to do that? I said, yes, sir. You know, my people are very happy. And wallah, my people in South Africa, when we get visitors, we are very happy. There are some countries in the Muslim world, they don't allow visitors. You know, keep them out. Hey! They can see through the window. Look, no, no. There are Muslims, you know, who are doing that kind of thing, treatment. Whenever Nabiya Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Christian deputation from Najran, he accommodated them in the Masjid al Nabawi, in the Masjid of the Prophet, three days and three nights. They slept there, they ate there, and they had a dialogue for three days and three nights. And when Sunday happened to come by during this period, he offered the Masjid al Nabawi for the Christians to offer the prayers. This is how tolerant he was, but we won't allow the non Muslim to come near the house of Allah. There are people. The best place, the best place for talking about Islam is the masjid. Open your masjids, man. Let them come and have them seated at the back. Let them watch. And when they watch the Muslim at prayer, and they go into the sujood, you don't know what happens to them. The impact that that sujood has upon the people. They see nothing there. No idols, no images, no pictures, nothing. And the man falling down to the ground. I'll tell you something more. I'll tell you about this. So I said, no, no, you'll be allowed. So I take them all, six of them, to the masjid. Please take off your shoes here. It's a type of inconvenience. But they say, well, they see something nice and funny. This is a general impression. In the masjid, they don't know what the masjid is, what the mosque is. They don't know the difference between a mosque and a temple. Generally, they don't know. We think, we assume that they know everything. They know nothing. Please take off your shoes. They started taking off the shoes. So I said, you know why you take off your shoes, sir? He says, no. I said, you remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where understandest is holy ground. I said, in respect of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. Before we go in for prayer, we make ablution, wudu. All the exposed parts of the body are being washed. The hands, the feet, the nostrils, the nape of the neck, gargling them out, brushing the teeth. I said, this the Muslim does five times a day, every day of the year. 
The one who is particular with his prayers. And purely from the hygienic point of view, no one is going to find fault with the person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And everybody agrees. It's a good hygienic practice. Secondly, it serves certain psychological purposes. We are washing not because we are dirty. We just had a shower this morning. No, we are washing because we are going to meet our Lord. We are going to stand before Him. So mentally it's preparing us for prayer. And thirdly, this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. In the book of Exodus. That is the second book of the Bible. It says, and Moses and Aaron and their sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. So we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. Though we haven't got the label of a Jew, nor yet that of a Christian. Yet in all humility we claim that we are more Jewish than the Jews and more Christians than the Christians. In this, that we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. In the house of prayer. Sit down, sir, right at the back. Had them seated. And the salat takes place. And we see, going to different postures. Allahu Akbar. So what is, what is all this you people doing? Mm, Allah. I said, no, this is to signify that we divorce ourselves from earth, all earthly things and we solely contemplate on God. So saying, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran, celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture, we celebrate His praises. In the Ruku, what you say? Subhana Rabbi Lazim, Subhana Rabbi Lazim, Subhana Rabbi Lazim. Glory to God the Great. Glory to God the Great. Glory to God. From there, we are rising. Samya Allah, Liman Hamida. Allah listens to the one that praises Him. We have the assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular veins, as the Holy Quran testifies, it says, We are indeed closer to you than your very life veins. If He is that close to us, then we do not have to shout on the top of our voices, wanting a deaf God to hear, because He listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and with that assurance we arise. And from this position, it's Allah Akbar, and we go into the sujood. And they see the people going to the sujood. That is the funniest thing that the Westerners see in the mosque. Funniest. To them it's funny. Silly. Putting the heads down, putting the bumps up. <laughs> they say, what a way to pray. <laughs> no, no, it goes. The thoughts. If you were not Muslim, the same thoughts will go through your mind. What is this guy doing? Huh? Putting the head down, putting the bumps up. This is the way to pray. No, this is human mind. The human mind works that way, brothers, sisters. That's how it works. <laughs> so when the guy goes, in, anybody goes into the sujood, he says, you see, sir, that is how Jesus prayed. To these people, I said, this is how all the prophets pray. All, I said, all. I said, it sounds like a sweeping generalization, but it is not so. If you have been reading your own holy scriptures, you will be able to confirm what I'm going to quote you now. And I'll quote you from your own book. It says, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And again, and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, and Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we read that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went there, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and he said, Wait and watch, look out, be careful, be on guard. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. And we are asking, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Can a circus acrobat do any better than that? No, no, when you say, how does a man, and Abraham, and Moses, and Aaron, and Joshua, and Jesus, and Muhammad, وسلم, they all fell on their faces and prayed. How does a man fall on his face and pray, except the way we Muslims do? Man, you can teach the guy without creating offense. We have a saying, you can kill the snake without breaking the stick. You can teach without creating offense. Hmm, fascinated, fascinated. The Salat, they witness, and they come back home. You sit down for tea and some samosas. Now, I start with them. Again, with my boss. I said, excuse me, sir. Have you seen the Quran? He says, no, do that. So, would you like to have a look at it, sir? He said, have you got an English translation? I said, yes, sir. He says, no, I don't mind. So, I had this same Quran, but in three volumes. Originally published in India, Pakistan, cheap paper, so it had to become very bulky, so they had to make it in three volumes. Ten, ten, ten separas. We call it separas, juice. 
So I took this Quran out. Between one couple, I gave one volume. Between the second couple, I gave another volume. And to my boss, I gave him the last volume. It has an index. So I deliberately gave him the last volume. So they all started opening, seeing inside. What's, what does it look like? What's, so I'm suggesting to my boss. said, excuse me, sir. You see at the back of that volume you have, there's an index. Look up the subject Moses. So he opened the index. Moses, Moses, there are dozens of references about Moses. Everything that you want to know, man, in the index. Jesus. Everything about Jesus. What do you want to know? In this Quran, everything on your fingertips. So he found Moses. I said, sir, if you want to check up actually what it says, you know, these are the headings. Have a look, see what it says. So he opened somewhere, he opened somewhere else. Then he looks at me. He says, D that, this book is very funny. <laughs> so what's funny about it, sir? What's funny about it, sir? He said, no, you see, this book seems to be speaking in our favor. But you people are all against us. You Muslims. <laughs> You know, he has been reading about Musa salam, and Firon in the confrontation with the Egyptians. The Egyptians set hard tasks for these people, made them to make bricks without straw, and they killed their sons and kept their daughters alive. And that was also a bitter, severe trial, keeping your daughters alive. And as they are growing, you know, the Egyptians are watching. Your daughter is growing up, 12, 14, developing. Mm -hmm. He's making his mouth water. You know, he's going to use them. These Egyptians, they did terrible, cruel things. I said, no, that is true, sir. You see, sir, your people were a God-fearing people. Do you believe in God? The Egyptians were mushriks. They were idolatrous people. And they said, hard task for you people. Injustice is committed against you. So God tells us so objectively that, look, these people were wrong. The Egyptians were wrong. And Allah saved these Jews from the Egyptian bondage. Right. But today, sir, I said, you see, the position is different. You see, you have usurped our lands. You stole our lands. I said, did that? How can you say that? <laughs> Palestine belongs to us. Palestine belongs to us. I said, how, sir? How, sir? How? He said, no, God promised it to us. I said, where, sir? Oh, he knew his Bible. He's a businessman, but he knew his Bible. He said, in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 8, God speaks to Hazrat Ibrahim Alisam, to the prophet Abraham. He says, I will give unto thee, to you, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, Palestine, for an everlasting possession, and I will be the God to see that they have it. I'll protect them. So God gave it to us. He promised it to us. That's his title deed. That's his title deed to Palestine. The Jews' title deed. It's in the Bible. And this is what they program the whole Western world. The Christians, the Americans are all programmed, brainwashed. So look here, here, the Bible that you own, the Christians. The Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews. The Christians accept it as the word of God. So look here, Genesis chapter 17 verse 8, God gave it to us. And these Arab barbarians, they won't allow us to live in peace. Look what they're doing to us. So the simple, they look, they can see the Americans and the British and the French, they can see the, the, the tyranny and the cruelty of the Jews. But so what can we do? Man, you see, God gave it to them. And these barbarians, they will not allow these people to live in peace. So we know it's wrong what they're doing, bulldozing people, breaking their arms. This is not right. But what can we do? This is God's promise. God says, give it to them. Let them have it, man. Programming. Brainwashing. The whole Western world, the Christian world is brainwashed. This man here, honestly, says, look, did that? this is promised by God to us. So I said, Mr. Beer, you see, in your book, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 21, God says, this is the book of Moses, supposed to be. His Torah. God says, that how are you to know whether the thing that is spoken by the prophet is from God or not? He says, 
God gives the answer to that. He poses the question and he gives the answer. He says, if the thing that the prophet says, if it does not come to pass, it does not happen, that is the thing the Lord has not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Right? He said, right. Is that a valid test? He said, yes. It's a valid test for applying to any prophecy, any basharat, anything that's going to happen in the future. This is a valid test. As given in the Bible. I said, shall we apply this to this prophecy? He said, yes. Yes, it's reasonable. We can apply this test. So I said, you see, sir, God promises Abraham, according to you, all the land of Canaan, the whole of Palestine, for an everlasting possession. And he said, I will be the God. I'll see to it that they are protected. The, all the land of Palestine. But I says, you know, sir, when Abraham died, he didn't own one square foot of land. According to your Bible. He was buried on a piece of land that was purchased by his son Ismail and Ishaq. They went to bury the father. But it was, he was buried on a purchased piece of land. And the Bible just says that when they died, they lived in hopes, not having received the promises. And Abraham didn't own one square foot of land. Not enough land to rest his foot upon. Means not even one square foot of land he owned. So if God offered him the whole of Palestine and he didn't get one square foot, that means that is not the promise of God. In the Quran we are told, Wa'adallahu haq. If Allah makes a promise, his promise is true. If this is Allah's promise, he will fulfill it. If it is not, he said, Wa'adallahu haq. My book tells me. And he didn't own one square foot of land. So that is not the promise of God. <sighs> Punctured. No, he's a reasonable man. He's my boss. But he's reasonable. He's punctured. But I didn't want to <laughs> cut short the story. I wanted to pursue the matter further. So I said, you see, sir, according to you, you are disqualified. This is not the promise of God. But I am prepared to concede. That God did make such a promise. I am prepared to concede. As if Palestine was my father's property. I am prepared to give. I am prepared to give away. As if Palestine was my father's property. I said look. I am prepared to concede. That God did make such a promise. Although you are disqualified. From your own book. The test. I am prepared to concede. What is the promise? Let's read it. He said I will give unto thee. And to thy seed after thee. Who is the seed of Abraham? He said, we the Jews. I said, no doubt you are the seed of Abraham, but are you the only seed? In the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, no less than 12 times, no less than 12 times, this God Almighty, in your book, he speaks about Ishmael. He tells Ibrahim al Islam, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I'll make him a great nation, because he is thy seed. He is your seed. And as for Ishmael, thy son, and as for Ishmael, thy seed, no less than twelve times in your Bible, Ishmael is spoken of as the son and seed of Abraham. Then what right have you to deny him that birthright? If your God says in your book, son, as for, as for Ishmael, thy son, as for Ishmael, thy seed, and as for 12 times in your book, the first book of the Bible, has that Ishmael is spoken of as the son and seed of Abraham. What right have you to deny him that? No doubt, you are also the seed of Abraham, the Jews. Hazrat Ibrahim a.s. had two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. The Arabs are the children of Ismail alayhi salam and, Is and the Jews are the children of Hazrat Ishaq alayhi salam. You are all both brothers. You are both the seed of Abraham. Why should you not live in peace and harmony in that country? If it was offered to the seed of Abraham, then both the seeds, you should live as brothers. He said, you see, did that. We had this under David and Solomon. You know, we own this place. So, we have taken it back. We just took back what was ours. We had it. Th thousand years before Jesus was born. We had this place. David ruled it. Solomon ruled it. Uh -huh. But I said, how did you get it, sir? You came from Egypt, a slave nation, a unified people, community, and you knocked hells into the Palestinians. The Bible says, in one day, in one day, the Jews killed 
30 kings. That means they conquered 30 kingdoms. In one day. Hitler couldn't do any such thing. In one day. 30 kings. What they are talking about is this, this village chief. The king. You call him a king. Well, you conquered him. You are a unified nation. 12 tribes coming together. And this one little villager hmm, killed him. Another villager killed him. And took his place to... 30 kingdoms they conquered in one day. 30 kings. It's like childish thing you're talking, man. You know, 30 kingdoms and 30 kings. No. So, I said, now how did you take it? By force of arms. And by force of arms, if you have a right to possess somebody else's land, then by force of arms, if the Arabs want to take it back, you have no right to complain. What's good for you, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It should be both equal. If you can take it by force of arms, then if the Arabs are trying to take it away from you by force of arms, you shouldn't complain. But he says, do that. You see, we have it. And possession is nine-tenth of the law. Nine-tenth of the law. Possession is nine-tenth. You got it, man. Now to wrench it, it's yours. But to get it out of his hand, it's a, it's a job. It's a job. Possession is... So we possess it. So I said, look, you had it. A thousand years ago, you had this place. We also had Eid, Spain. We Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. If we have the power once more again, can we go and claim Spain? He said, our fathers built the Alhambra. You know, fountains and gardens and shh, monumental buildings. Allah describes it in the Holy Quran. Kam tarakum in jannatim uyun. How many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazumu makam in kareem and cornfields and monumental buildings. Wa ni'matin kanu fi hafakihin. And wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. All these things left by my forefathers. Have I a right to go and claim it? If you had the power. Can you go and claim Spain? So our fathers had it. He says no. Can the Dutch go and claim Indonesia once more again? He says, we ruled it for 300 years. He says, no. Can the Portuguese reclaim Mozambique? He says, we ruled it for 500 years. He says, no. Then what right have you to Palestine? <laughs> because your fathers had it. You have a right? You have no right. How did you get it? Hmm. This thing carried on. And at the end, Mr. Beer, my boss, tells me, this is D-Dad. We didn't know that the Arabs had a case. No program from childhood. Palestine belongs to us. And these Arab barbarians, they won't allow us to live in peace. So now they are fighting with a spirit of jihad. This is our land, our possession. God gave it to us. We must protect it. That's programming. Programming. You have to reprogram the people. He said, we didn't know that the Arabs had a case. Did that. I want you to write what you told me. And I will publish it in my Temple David magazine. He was an editor of a reform synagogue, Jewish church. He said, you write this and I will publish it in my Temple David magazine. I said, Mr. Beer, I can't write. I'm not a writer. He said, I can easily talk anything. At the drop of a pin, I can get started. I can talk. But writing is an ordeal. He said, no, no, do that. You just write as you say and I will improve it for you. And he meant it. He meant it. But I didn't reach that stage of writing. What I had spoken. What do you think my position in the firm next day? Fired. No, no. No. From next morning, I am Mr. D-Dat. He comes in to the shop and says, Good morning, Mr. D-Dat. He goes for lunch and says, Good afternoon, Mr. D-Dat. He goes out in the evening and says, Good evening, Mr. D-Dat. D-Dat becomes Mr. D-Dat. No, no, no. Allah says, Minhumul mu'minu. Now, among them, there are good people. Wa'akthiruhumul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. There are goodly people among them. Now, he goes and tells the other Jews in the establishment. So, this guy did that. You know, that dispatch clerk. Hey, that guy, he knows something. You know, he made rings around me, around him. So I'm passing by with my dust coat, white dust coat I used to wear, uh, walking around the shop, doing my work. And one of the managers of the clothing department, Mr. Baynard by name, not the Jew, he calls and says, did that come here? I say, yes, sir. He says, you know, you made rings around Mr. Beer. But you can't do it to me. You know, as for Ishmael, Ishmael was a bastard. 
Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam. What would an Arab do? Tell me, tell me. Knife him. Yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if you don't know any, what, look, the guy calls our progenitor, Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam, a bastard. You are, you are entitled to put a knife through the guy. Huh? Huh? No matter what they call you afterwards, terrorist and what, fanatic and what and what not. But no, you see, once you knew that you got the guy, when he said that, I said, I got him. Right? There's no time to argue and debate in the shop. Because as soon as we start, the boss comes along and says, you run away, finish. And then you can't get to it again. This, this is a business, business time. And you don't do things like that. You don't start arguing and debating there and there. I said, Mr. Bainhart, why don't you come home with your wife and, you know, we will chat about these matters. But you can't do to me what you did to Mr. B. I said, who's talking about doing anything? You know, I'm telling you. Right. Now, from there on, every time I pass by, I said, you know, I spoke to my wife about you, sir. And she's looking forward to you and your wife coming and visiting us for dinner. You know, every time. He says, you know, my wife is still asking, when you're coming? When you're coming? Shh. Pressure. Pressure is on. Come home, you know, with your friends. Come home. He said, you can't do to me what you did to me. I said, who's talking about doing anything, man? You come home. <laughs> <laughs> I persuaded him. So Mr. and Mrs. Beer, Baynard comes along. And Mr. and Mrs. Peel, Christians. And Mr. Townsend. He was a backroom boy for the uh, full gospel church. Three Christians and two Jews. But the Jews were the primary uh, guests of mine. Same process, same food, same masjid, visit to the masjid, come back again, same tea and samosas. <laughs> right, now we are settled down, relaxed. I said, Mr. Bainat, you remember you told me in the shop that Ishmael was a bastard? He said, yes. I said, do you still stand by that? He said, of course. I thought maybe the tea and the samosas and the food might have changed his mind. <laughs> no, it had no effect. no effect. He said, yes. So I said, all right. All right, Mr. Benat, tell me now. According to Judaism, your religion, the religion has given to you, Judaism, which is preferable for a man to marry his own sister and beget a child by her or marry a slave woman? An African woman. Between these two alternatives, your own sister, you're going to beget a child from her, have sex with her, and beget a child from your own sister, or an African woman, a slave woman, who is preferable according to your religion. He says, no, the African woman is preferable. I say, according to eugenics, genetics, which is preferable? For you to beget a child from your own sister, a bastard child from your own sister, or from an African woman? A negress. That's what they say. Hajra was a slave woman, born woman from Egypt. She was actually a princess of Egypt. But now, let us stay, whatever they say, is right. She was a slave woman, a born woman, an African woman, a negress. But between these two, your sister and this, which is preferable? He says, no, that negress is preferable. According to the science of eugenics, sex, genetics. I said, according to your common sense. Between these two alternatives, which is preferable? He said, no, the African woman, the slave woman, the bond woman is preferable. That's the right answers. The answers are right. That's right. Open your book, book of Genesis. Your own book, your Bible. He says that Abraham went to a certain place and the king of the place saw Sarah. She was beautiful, the Hebrew woman. Mm. And he took a liking for her. So he's asking Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. He said, what is this woman to you? So the Bible says, he said, she is my sister. He said, right, send her in into the haram. Send her in. In the prerogative of kings. In those days, the king says, your sister, your mother, your daughter, and they send her in. And you say, no, you chop off your head. <laughs> so he's got no alternative. He sends his wife, Sarah, into the king's haram. And the Bible says, this guy couldn't come right with her. Whole night he struggled. I don't know what was the reason. The Bible doesn't explain what was going on. But whole night he struggled. Frustrated in the morning. He wants to know from Ibrahim, what is this woman to you? Because on account of her I had a restless night. 
He had come right with every woman that he has handled so far, but he couldn't come right with Sarah. What? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But he couldn't come right. So he wants to know, what is this woman to you? Now he says, she's my wife. He said, why, didn't, why did you tell me a lie? You know, you are a man of God. If I had done something wrong to her, God could have destroyed me. Why did you lie to me? So, according to his Bible, he says, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, for indeed she is my sister. I didn't lie to you. She is my sister. But of the same father, but different mother. Same father means father's seed. It's your sister. And she became my wife. So, I said, according to Judaism, according to your eugenics, according to your common sense, Hajra's child was preferable. If Ishmael is a bastard, then Isaac is a greater bastard. According to Judaism, every, every, every test that you have, your, your, your progenitor is a greater bastard. Look, Astaghfirullah, we don't talk like that. But now this is the only language the guy understands. See, he's used that language. So I said, look, if Ishmael is a bastard because he's the son of a born woman, then your is Ishaq is a greater bastard, brother and sister, sex incest, that's incest, and eugenics and common sense from every point of view, your Isaac is a greater bastard, so your progeny is worse than that of Ishmael. <laughs> no. This is going on. Then I'm invited by the Jews after the Six-Day War. You see, this is now they want to know how you feel. I went on a lecture tour of the, of the Cape province. And uh, they saw the advertisements in the newspapers. Like this morning, there was in this tribune. How many of you have seen that Edward this morning in the tribune? Please put up your hand. How many of you saw the Edward today in the Chicago tribune? Not many. We don't read your papers too much. <laughs> no. So these Jews, they saw my adverts, they contacted my organizers, they said, look man, this Mr. D. Dad, if you would be prepared to come and speak to us. So my organizers asked me, the Jews want you to go and speak to them. I said, right. To me it's an opportunity. Wallah, it is an opportunity. We must look for opportunities. We must create opportunities. Somehow get, deliver the message, man. Deliver the message. No man who the person is. I have delivered lectures in synagogues. I have delivered lectures in churches. I have delivered lectures in Hindu temples. Allah. Look, our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam around the Kaaba. All those idols were there and he used to preach to them. Why shouldn't we? Opportunity. The guy calls you to a church. Go and talk, man. Temple, synagogue, go and talk. Deliver the message. The best you can. So the Jews went to me. Yes, all right. Students of the University of Cape Town. They had purchased a church hall. And they were going to invite me. That's how I went. Right. And I started with this verse that I read to you from the Holy Quran. I read to them. The chairman introduced me, Mr. Didat, the great speaker from Durban, South Africa. And you know, uh, he'll come and speak to us today on the Quran and the Jew. That was a topic then. And I said, I got up. قَالَ رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِ وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِ وَحْلُ الْأُقْدَةً مِّنْ لِسَانِ يَفْكَهُ قَوْلِ And the Jews, boys and girls and grown-ups, they're straining their ears to hear what the guy is talking about, man. You know, we thought he's going to deliver a lecture to us, but he's trying to mesmerize us, hypnotize us huh? with some incantation. So I said, no, 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 no. I'm not trying to mesmerize or hypnotize you people. I have read a prayer of the Holy Prophet Moses and I gave the philosophy behind that. I said, I have more need for that prayer than Moses had. Hmm? Talking to you, you know, in communication there are barriers, barriers. Musa a.s. had a, a flaw, defect. I have, haven't got that defect. But in communication, language is a barrier and psychology is a barrier. As soon as I stand up before the Jews, they know this guy's an enemy and they're turned up to say, now what he's going to say? You know, how are we going to counteract it? So you're not listening. You're not listening. There are barriers. So I'm praying to Allah to remove those barriers. Then it says, you know, look, between me and you, what is the difference? Be what's the difference between the Muslim and the Jews? Really speaking, no difference. In the concept of the divinity, concept of God, the Jew says, God Almighty is absolutely unique. He has no partners. He has no sons. God is not seen at any time. No man can see God and live. And we give our hand of acceptance to the Jew that we believe as you believe.
The Jew says no eating of the flesh of swine. We say we won't eat it. He says no eating of blood. We say we won't touch it. He says circumcision. We say we are circumcised. What more do you want? No, no. What more do you want, man? <laughs> I would say that Islam is Judaism made universal. It's the same religion on a universal level. We accept all the Jewish prophets as our prophets. And all the heroes as our heroes. I'm not talking about the modern ones. With them we are at war. <laughs> No, no. We, we are proud to read the Holy Quran and say, Bismillah ar-Rahman. Wa qatala Dawudu jaluta wa ta'ahullahu al-mulka wal hikmata wa allamuhu mimma yasha. Aren't you happy to read that? Huh? You have any qualms about that? Wa qatala Dawudu jaluta and David killed Goliath. Who is David? Jew. Who is Goliath? Palestinian. Look, this Jew killed a Palestinian and you are happy. Huh? Look at it. So Allah said, وَقَتَلَ دَعُدُ جَالُوتَ وَاتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ Allah gave him dominion, وَالْحِكْمَةَ and wisdom, وَاللَّمَهُ مِمَّا يَشَاء And whatever else he will. We are happy. Hazrat Musa a.s. is my prophet. Dawud a.s. is my prophet. Suleiman a.s. is my prophet. Up to a certain age, I didn't know that these are the prophets of the Jews. Wallah! And some of my children, I don't know about you American Muslims, how much you know, but if you ask my children in South Africa, who is, who is Musa alayhi salam? He's my prophet. Who is Dawud alayhi salam? My prophet. Who is Suleiman alayhi salam? My prophet. Who is Isa alayhi salam? My prophet. He's not thinking he's a Jew, he's a Jew, he's a Jew. Well, we're not thinking that they are Jews. We're thinking they are the righteous servants of Allah. And as such, we love them, respect them, revere them. As we say, follow them. No fight, no fight. We accept all the Jewish prophets as our prophets. The only problem is they won't accept one of ours. That is the irony. We accept all the prophets. <laughs> and Allah tells us in the Quran that he's given us a deen confirming what is already with you. Nothing new, man. Nothing new. It's the same religion, universal level. He has made his a racial religion. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. If you fall in love with a Jewish girl, and if she's particular, and you must be converted, then you say, you agree, they put you through a process, at the end of it, you get converted, and one Christian Africana, he said at the age of 23, I was painfully circumcised to marry a Jewish girl. But he's still a third grade Jew. He's not accepted. In the heart and mind, he's still a goyim, filthy, dirty guy. But what can I do? My daughter has fallen in love with him, willy nilly, so that he can marry her. But he's still a third grade Jew. That is so. Hmm. So, I said, look, all the, my my. My eldest son is Ibrahim. My youngest son is Yusuf, same as Joseph. My brother-in-law is Musa, Moshe. We give our children Jewish names, but they're not Jewish as far as we are concerned. They are the names of the righteous servants of God. What is the difference? Our fight is political. We are both fighting for a piece of land. My brothers, the Arabs, they say Palestine belongs to them. My cousins, the Jews, they say Palestine belongs to them. That's the battle is for a piece of land. We are fighting for land. Both of them. This is not a war like the Muslim saying kill the Jew because he's a Jew. Or the Jew says kill the Muslim. Kill the Arab because he's a Muslim. Mm -hmm. That's not the fight. They're not, they don't want to kill you because you are a Muslim. And you don't want to kill him because he's a Jew. They are both fighting for a piece of land. We are both fighting for land. So this is mine. That guy said, this is mine. Given to me. Both are fighting for a piece of land. So let us talk, man. Let us talk. Let us disabuse their minds. Talk, reason. So I said, you know, that was after the 67 war. I said, you know, you defeated my brothers once. You defeated them twice. First, 48. Then 56. Then 67. 70, 73 hadn't happened then. So you defeated my brothers thrice. And you can defeat them 30 times. But you won't have solved the problem. The problem still remains. I said the Arabs can afford to lose a hundred battles. They can afford to lose a hundred battles. But you can't afford to lose one. You know that? If one you lose, I said it's finished for you. It's good. You're finished for good. Yes, you'll be wiped out. Once he loses one, he's finished for good. There's no more Jews left if you lose. And you can't tell me in your history that you never lost a battle. That you'll never lose. You are beating my brothers because of technology. Superior technology. Superior education. 
The Jews, they admit that the average Arab soldier is a better specimen of mankind, manhood, than the average Jew. He's a better man, man, from manliness point of view. But he's getting beaten. Why? Because he is a standard six Johnny, the Arab soldier. That guy is a matriculant. See, average soldier. So now that guy can carry out instructions far better than you. So it's the technology, the machines that he's wielding. That's beating him. And then again, so we are not fighting the Jews. Every time we go into battle, we are fighting America. No, it's America. It's not the Jew. 1973, for the first time, the Arabs took the initiative. First time in history. Previously, every time they were talking. We'll kill the Jew. We'll fight him. And preemptive strike. You talk, 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 he'll give it to you. You talk, 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 he'll give it to you. There's a saying, twice armed is he whose cause is just, but thrice armed is he who gets in first. He's triply armed. Like. You talk, you are in the right, you are in hack, but I give it to you, one go flying, it's finished. You finish. You hack, you're in hack, but hack, finish, you're gone. Knocked out. This is what's happening. So, for the first time, the Arabs took the initiative. 73, the Ramadan war, the October war. Hmm? America warned the Jews. I don't know whether you people know. America warned the Jews that the Arabs are on the move. They can see, man, through the satellites what's going on there. The movements, movements of dark patches. This is some metal moving. Armored cars, tanks moving, moving, getting closer towards the Suez. They warned the Jews, this is the Arabs are on the move. They took it lightly. The Jews said, no, nah, these Arabs, man, they can't, they can't fight. They can't fight without shouting. They'll have to say, we'll hit you and, we'll, and then we'll give it to them. But first time, Sada. He played a stroke of genius. And silently, he did the job. He crossed the bar lev line and into the Sinai. He had the Jews by the throat. First time. <laughs> and America, direct intervention through the Azores. Men and material, right into the battlefield. Turn the tables. So what do you do? This is the situation. Every time you go to war, you're fighting America. And this giant, I'm watching it. I'm seeing his, his airports. You know, all these airports, I'm traveling from place to place. I say, man, this nation, how can you conquer this nation? How can you beat this Jalut, this Goliath? How can you crack his skull? How, how, how? No, 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 don't despair. His size is his undoing. His might is... This is undoing. But now you have to use psychology. You have to learn now techniques. How to get under his skin. How to talk to him. You have to learn, my dear brothers and sisters. You have to learn how to talk. A frontal fight, no hope. No hope. <laughs> you can't outgun the fellow and you can't uh, out ungrain the fellow. You can't do anything. But intellectually, you can do the job. Allah tells us in the Holy Quran that is given you a deen. So, he has sent his messenger with guidance, الحق, and with the religion of truth, that it may prevail, overcome and supersede every other deen. Now, the mushrik might not like it. And he repeats the same formula again. And he ends by saying, Wakafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah as a witness to this fact that he's going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you, rubbish. You don't do the job, he says, Yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. He'll substitute in your place another people. Thumma lahayakun wa msalakum. Then they won't be like you, rubbish. You can do the job. But now you have to learn to talk. Learn with your tongue and with the intellect. You can knock him over. You can bowl him over. And he's a ready market. The American is the fittest guy to receive the message. I'm telling you. Talk to him, man. Humble yourself. Talk to him. He'll be amused. He's disarmed. And the way you little pygmies. All of you, forgive me. <laughs> you Bangladeshi and you Hindi and you uh, Malaysians and you Indonesians and all this, uh, in front of the Texan, the Texan, the mighty Texan. You know, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, he feels he's, that he's a giant, and you're little pygmies. You know, come on. What, uh, what are you talking about? He's in, he's, he's he's disarmed. You know, he's a sitting duck before you. Allah, because that complex, Jalut. He got knocked out how? Same, that complex, his size, is big, you know, it's great. I can squeeze you to death. Yes, yes, yes. But he falls target to a small stone. Crack his skull. Same, same, same. This Jalut. 
Same, same. Learn, learn how to talk. However, these Jews, I'm telling them, this is the problem. You beat my brothers once, you beat them twice, beat them thrice, beat them 30 times, 300 times, but you haven't solved the problem. It's technology which is in your favor. But technology is not a closed shop. Sooner or later, the Arabs will also acquire technology. Then I said, sooner or later, this America will let you down. It can happen. America can let you down. When it suits them, they'll let you down. <laughs> they let so many nations down. And it doesn't suit them. It suited them to help the Kuwaitis. They helped them, right? Suited them. Well, if Kuwait was producing sausages, you think these guys would have gone there? Huh? No, no. If it suits, I said, one day, these guys will let you down. And then, what is your position? I said, why don't you come to terms with them now? I said, you see, the Arab world needs you. Look, I don't know. There might be some brothers here, extremists, and I should be that. This guy is a traitor. You know, I'm trying to tell you to sell out. Sell out. No, no, no. No, my brothers and sisters. This is my stand from the very beginning. I have been telling the Palestinians. I said, look, open a second front. Open a second front against the Jew. Russia, Second World War. When Germany attacked Russia, 2,000 kilometers non-stop. German soldiers marched 2,000 kilometers non-stop. And she's crying for second front. Second front, open a second front, man. You know, you from Europe, from somewhere, open against the Germans, a second front to, to, to decrease this pressure on them. And it suited these guys to allow them to say, let them die. 22 million Russians died in the Second World War. You know, this guy suited them to say, weaken that country too. They'll do it, but second front. I said, now open a second front against the Jews. Where? How? From Syria? From Jordan? Hmm, not, I'm not talking about military. I said, yeah, militarily I can't advise you anything. If you're throwing stones, I can't tell you how to throw better stones. Hmm? I won't tell you, no, why don't you take up the gun? No, I'm not qualified. Well, I'm not qualified to give you advice. What you're doing, carry on. But open a second front. So what do you mean second front? I said, an intellectual battle. Talk, man, talk. Talk to the guy. Reason with the people. I said, look, this is what the Jewish claim is. And let's analyze it. Let's analyze. Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. See, what does it say? He said, I will give you and your seed after you. Talk to the Americans. Talk to them. Say, look, sir, look, you haven't understood. He says, seed. Who are the seed of Abraham? They say, Isaac, Jew. I said, look, read, man. Your book, your Bible says 12 times. Ishmael is the son and seed. Ishmael is the son and seed of Abraham. How can you deny him that birthright? Talk to him. His, 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 his stubbornness, his resistance will listen. The Jew, talk to him. These guys, men, I tell you, they are reasonable people. I'm talking to these students. Then I said, you see, what is going to happen then? They, at the back of the mind, they can realize it can happen. One day, they can lose a battle. They can't say they'll win forever. One day you lose a battle and then it's finished for you. Why wait for that? Why not come to terms? I said, you see, the Arab world needs you. I don't know, whether you call it psychology or what, diplomacy. I said, the Arab world needs you. You are a new heart in the body of the Arab world. But when you transplant a new heart into a body, that Chris Barnard in my country, the first guy to have this heart transplants, he discovered and he told the world that the body wants to reject the heart. There's a fight going on. You put on a new heart into any body, that body is going to put up a fight. So they have to drug the body, drug the body, drug the body, till the body is so senses uh, let it remain there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how you make that body to accept that new heart. You know that? But the body wants to fight. It's a foreign matter. Reject it. Kick it out. And in the process, the body is going to kill the heart and the body will also die. I said, you are a new heart in the Arab world. The Arab world needs you. And you need the body. You need the body and they need a the heart. Had it not been for you, the Arab world would have been sleeping, the sleep of slumbering for centuries, decades. You know, smoking away the hookah. But look, what's happening there? In the Arab world, wallah, they're waking up. Industrialization. Wheat. Saudi Arabia produces wheat supplying to Russia. Wheat. A desert country supplying wheat 
I have seen grapes and melons growing in the desert. You can imagine, wallah, you can imagine this Saudi Arabia, the, the desert land. What's happening there? I said, it's not, it's, had it not been for the Jews, all these things wouldn't have happened. The Jews are waking you up. He's waking up the Muslim world. So we need the heart, new heart. But the body doesn't recognize the heart. So I said, look, easy solution. I sound very simplistic at times. But Allah, some of these truths are so simple you can't imagine. You just can't imagine how simple solutions can be. We are looking for complicated solutions. So I said, you see, the body is going to reject the heart. In the process, the body will die. They are killing another. We can kill, keep on killing one another. So the body is destroyed and the heart is destroyed. I said, you see, the reason is because the cellular construction of the heart is different from the cellular construction of the body. The body is Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. Every cell is Muslim, 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 Muslim. The heart is Jew, 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 Jew. Every cell of the heart is Jew, 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 Jew. So this body can't recognize that this, this heart is a, a friend. It's come to help him. Mm, you can't see that. He's going to fight and going to destroy the heart and destroy itself in the process. So I said, man, you change the label. Change the label. And there's no copyright on the label. You know that? Muslim. A Jew becomes a Muslim, is a copyright? You say you can't become Muslim? Is there a copyright? There's no copyright. So I said, look, become a Muslim. Accept Islam. You know? Accept Islam. And man, the body and the, uh, so the heart will be compatible to one another. At question time. The Jews are very brilliant people. I like, I like, I like to talk to them. You see, they put up a good fight. I like that. The younger generation, come and put up a good fight. I like a good fight. But when you conquer him with the intellect, that guy, he agrees with you and he's prepared to fight for you. That's a university student. You convince him that, look, this is it. And objectively, you present the case in humility. Not that we'll do this to you and we'll do that to you. No, no, no. I said, look, this is a solution to the problem. Your body, your heart is Jew, 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 and the body is Muslim, 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 and there is no copyright on the label. Why don't you change your label? What is the difference? Really, there's no difference. The only thing is that they don't accept our Nabi Akarim. We accept all the Jewish prophets as our prophets, all the heroes as our heroes. Only they won't accept one of ours. That is the biggest problem. So, you accept Islam, change the label, problem is solved. So at question time, one Jewish student, he said, why don't you change your label? <laughs> no, no, that's that. I like that. I like that, you know. Mm. They come fighting. They don't just, tell. whatever you say, say, ditto, ditto, ditto. No, no. So why don't you change your label? I said, look, I don't mind. Look, that's me. I said, I don't mind changing my label. I don't know what you would say. I don't know. But I said, look, I don't mind. But you see, if I want to change my label, you're going to put hurdles in my way. I know that. Make difficult for me. You don't want to accept me as a Jew. But even if I succeed, I'm still a third grade Jew. But let's say, what happens? I said, how many are you in the world today? How many? So one guy said, 15 million. I said, right. So we become 15 million and one. Right? I change my label, I become a Jew. So how many we are now? 15 million and one. Okay. I said, you have a product, you are a business people, for which you have a market of 15 million. As soon as you change your label, we are 1,000 million. 1,000 million customers you get. You are a bloody fool if you didn't change the label. And when there's no, there's no copyright on the label. Being a Muslim, is there a copyright? So now, so there is no copyright on it, man. And you're a business people. Come on, man. You want to do business. They want to do business. All this is happening, whatever compromises is because of business. Not the throwing of the stones. Business. They want to do business, man. They want to make money. This is, to me, this is what the whole secret of the Jew, you know, trying to say, all right, we'll give you a bit of West Bank and we'll give you a bit of Gaza and all that. This is all business. They want to do business. They're getting strangulated in business. They want to do business. A thousand million Muslims will buy. What a fantastic opportunity for business. They'll be the topmost people in the Middle East. The richest people in the Middle East will be the Jews. They want to do business. So I said, right, you have a product for which you have a market of 15 million. You change the label and you get a thousand million customers.
You are a bloody fool if you don't change the label. Let's see that. That's right. Another guy comes forward. He says, who will do the job? Who will do this job? He, he bought He bought the idea. He said, right. This is a great idea. And they are talking. They are talking. They, must, they need another alternative other than the gun. There are good people among them. Wallah, there are. Abe Nathan has been going to prisons again and again talking to the Palestinians. Abe Nathan. Sabra and Shatila massacre. 300,000 Jews. They marched in Tel Aviv to the house of Begin with placards. Says, Begin and Sharon, there's blood on your hands. Resign. 300,000 Jews they gathered. After the Sabra and Shatila massacre. No Muslim nation on earth, man. No capital ever did any such thing like that. The Jews did it. Said Begin and Sharon, there's blood on your hands. Resign. No, there are good people. Allah says, Minhumul mu'minuna wa aksaruhumul fasikun. Why don't you learn to talk to the guy? Talk to him, man. Talk to him. And you see, uh, uh, to me, I don't think that Allah has installed at their destruction. There must come along a time that we will come have a report between the Muslim and the Jew. The Jews will become Muslim, inshallah. And we can work together. <laughs> now, don't say I'm a sellout. What Arafat is doing, I said, look, I can't tell you. I can't give you advice. Don't ask me questions, whether it's right or wrong. I said, look, to me, to me, it's an opportunity for talking. I want to talk. I want to go to Israel. I want to talk to the Jews. I said, your prophet Moses the greatest man. In his last and final revelation, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18, he says, Navi akim lahim mikariv achayhim. That's his Hebrew. That's Hebrew. Navi akim lahim mikariv achayhim kamukhawi natati before we debir. I said, who is this prophet? In Arabic, he says, Ukimu lahum nabiyam min wasate ikhwatim mitlaka wa ajalu kalami fi famihi fa yakallamuhum bi kulli ma bihi. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Hikko mamit takim vi kullu muhammadim zehdudi zehrei bainat Yerushalam. Who is this muhammadim? In your book, in the original Hebrew, muhammadim. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. Talk to him. And to me, I want an opportunity to go and talk to him. And I want you all to talk to him. Talk to him, man. Give him that opportunity to reject. And then let Allah do the job. You do your job. You deliver your message. And then... If the guy is still resistant, then leave it to Allah. But talk, man, talk. So this is my message to my brothers and sisters. We have to learn to talk to the Jews, to the Christians, to the Hindus, to the atheists and the agnostics. With everybody, you must find ways and means of getting to their heart. This is the awwal fard of the Muslim. Long before Salat, Zakat, Hajj and Psalm became fard, Allah Baritala tells his Rasul, and through him he is telling us, he says, Fazakir innama anta muzakir. He says, You, you deliver the message. Because it is your duty to deliver the message. Lasta alayhim be musaitir. You will not be questioned regarding them. Illa man tawalla wa kafar. Why they accepted or why they didn't accept, Allah won't ask you. He will ask you, Did you deliver the message? And if he can honestly say, Ya Baritala, oh my Lord, we tried to the best of our ability, whether it was great or small, good enough. Allah will say, My jannat is open for you. But can we say that we have tried? That is all, my dear brothers and sisters. We say, learn to talk, learn to open your mouth, learn to share. Ha, ah, says, who will do the job? I said, you will do the job. The Jews ask me, who will? I said, you. Get off from my chest. The Arab, you're sitting on our chest. Get off and give your hand. He says, brother, brother, look, please forgive us. What can we do? Where can we go? We are sorry for what all these things that has happened. Tell him and watch the Arab. I says he will shed tears and accept you. This is to me, this is the Arab. This is his nature. Ghulam and Halima, Allah describes him. He's Ghulam and Halima. I have seen it happen again and again. Up to 12 o'clock midnight. Cairo Radio is broadcasting against King Faisal. You know, he's a you know, all the all the kinds of words that they use, political words, you know, those are bloody rubbish, you know. He's like this and like that. Till midnight, 12 o'clock, Cairo radio is blasting away. And Nasser sends a message. Faisal, come over. I want to talk to you. And Faisal comes along. They meet on the tarmac in Cairo. <laughs> and they embrace one another and they cry. <laughs> They're shedding tears. as a bloody hypocrites. No, no. This is the nature of the Arab. Up to midnight, the guy was out to kill you. 
No, he said, brother, you know, the Jews, 67 war. The Jews, you know, they're preparing to attack us. And what can you do? You embrace one of them. <laughs> King Hussein of Jordan, same. Cairo radius bl blasting away. You know, they, oh, what they call them all kinds of names. Hmm? Want to destroy the jo King Hussein. And Nasser calls King Hussein and he comes and they meet in the tarmac and Nasser and Hussein and they embrace one of them. They cry. Stay. I'm telling you, this is this Arab. Talk to him, man. Talk to him. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I have taken so much more time than what I was supposed to speak. May you people have mercy on me. Forgive me for being over talkative. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. A bigger takbir. That's good. If you have any questions for the brothers, please stand up in line in this, uh, in front of this microphone. And for the sisters, please make a room for the sisters. Brothers on this side, please make a room for the sisters. Uh, from the front down to the side, please. If any sisters want to ask a question, please come here. And don't talk until I give you the uh, permission to talk. And we'll ask uh, Mr. Didad to answer. Uh, Assalamu my name, Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Khalid Arya. I attend the uh, Mass Foundation in Chicago Ridge, and we were so pleased first to hear that you were coming to Chicago. Uh, you're one of the greatest that we ever heard. Keep going. And I want to tell you one thing. I'm a Palestinian, and I'm 30 years old, and this is the first time that I have heard a true story about Palestine and about the truth. The problem is we, we've been deceived for so many years. Our parents don't know the facts. Our parents don't know the truth. And thank you for bringing out the fact in, in the Palestinian story. Uh, next question, your name please, and, and a question quickly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Ziyad Muhammad, and uh, first I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and accept your efforts, my brother did that. And uh, my question, you ask us in your lecture to uh, use reason and to talk to the Jews, the Christians, and everybody who is not a Muslim. And my question is this. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the, the one who we follow completely in our path, he used reason with the Jews, he talked to them, and but what was the result? They tried to kill him, they put every obstacle in his way, and they fought him fiercely. And what was the result? They did not accept his mission. And if we read the Quran, we find that the Jews themselves, they are sick in their hearts, and they do not accept the truth, even we reason with them. So what is your advice to us in the course of history? We read and we follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam path. Thank you. In the time of our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see, humanity had reached certain mental status. The Jews of the time, their understanding, the Jews today, the way we are able to talk to them, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the dialogues I had with the Jews, I find that they are, they are people, they put up a fight, I said they put up a fight, and I enjoy a good fight. But the person is prepared to give in. My boss, my, you know, he had no reason to appease me. He is my boss, and I tell him everything, and he says, look, do that. We didn't know that the Arabs had a case. Put it down into writing and I will publish it in my magazine. And there are Jews in Palestine. They are doing these things today. They are prepared to listen to you. They are prepared to talk to you. They are talking for you. Otherwise, Rabin couldn't have done what he is doing now. If there were no Jews at all to support him. They want peace. So the thing is, is to talk. I said, now, Allah didn't close the, shop, close the book. He said, the Jews are out of bounds. He says... In the Holy Quran, this is Kuntum Khaira Ummatin Ukrajatlin Nas. You are the best of people evolved for mankind. Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna nil munkar. Because you enjoin what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah. Walau amana ahlul kitabi ilakana khaira lahum. But if the people of the book, who are the people of the book? Jews and Christians. Allah says, if they hearken unto this message, it will be better for them, in other words, it will be better for you. Minhumul mu'minuna. Among them there are good people, faithful people. Otherwise Allah said, look, don't talk to the Jews. They are bloody rubbish. They want, they should be destroyed. Kill them as vermins. 
that Allah doesn't say that. He's telling you to call them Ya Ahlul Kitab Ta'alaw. Ya Ahlul again and again in the Quran. Ya Ahlul Kitab Ta'alaw. La taghlu fi dinakum. Ya Ahlul Kitab Ta'alaw. Ila kalimatin sawaim bainana wa bainakum. What is all this for? If it is for a things to be closed, look, the Jews are finished. Allah will destroy them and at your hands. <laughs> so now I said, that wishful thinking carry on. But now Allah doesn't say that. He says, talk to them, call them. And inshallah, there is a hope that there are some among them who will listen. Yes, my brother. Okay. I think you my sister. Your name? Yes, my name is April and I have a question. Um, one thing you've been saying is to discuss with people, um, to reason with them. And my question is, to do that, you have to have knowledge. And what kind of education do you have? How did you gain the knowledge that you have? You know, how if somebody is trying to learn, what would you suggest? What would you recommend? Yes, you see, knowledge comes. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Balligo anni walau ayah." Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse. You know, one fact. Just share that. And in sharing that one fact, Allah will give you more. I started this work in nine, 40 years ago with one verse, with one verse. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. That's the only thing I knew. And I started speaking everywhere what the Bible says about Muhammad. That's a topic. And Deuteronomy 18, 18. Next place. What the Bible says about Muhammad. Deuteronomy 18, 18. That's the only thing I know. Deuteronomy 18, 18. And my friends, they gave me a nickname. 1818. 1818. <laughs> so, out of that 1818, I'm now able to speak to you. I have written some 20 little booklets. I've written some books and I'm talking. There are 76 videotapes available. All started from 1818. Similar to you now, you have been given a book, Arabs and Israel Conflict or Conciliation. Now, you just master a few verses, few facts. This Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. Memorize that. Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. Memorize that only. God says, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be the God. If you want to do this job, just memorize that only and talk about that and the rest will be added on, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum. I have a question for Brother uh, Ahmad Idad. Jazakallah khairan. If you happen to live in Gaza, and uh, the Jews uh, killed your two sons, and they detained your grandson, and they preventing you to go to Al-Aqsa and pray. Do you really feel like talking to them, or do you really feel like doing like Prophet Muhammad did in Khaybar? Now, here is another rule. Brother, you are out of order. Not you, not you. No, no, please sit down. Thank you very much for asking the question. The brother next to you, you are out of order and you are not to do this again. I am the one who asks people to do takbir or not. Is that acceptable? Thank you very much. Thank you. My brother, you see, at the Fatih Makkah, our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he conquered Makkah, what they had done to him and his his own daughter, she was pierced through her body when she was alighting from a camel. Hmm? These very murderers, the mushriks of Makkah. What did he do to them all? Chop off their heads. Except for three. Except for three persons. The amnesty was given, general amnesty to everybody. They asked, he asked them, what do you expect at my hands today? And they said, they knew his nature too well, said, mercy, O oh generous brother and nephew. So he says, I will speak to you as Joseph spoken to his brethren. I will not reproach you today. Go, ye are free. As an individual, as a person, I feel exactly as you feel. I would like to exterminate every Jew in the world. But I says, now what have you achieved? What have you done? The thing is this, my dear brothers, even then it has happened to you, it has happened to his family as well. Now, what do you do? It's a come to terms, learn to talk, reproachment, 
and if you can make him into a Muslim, he becomes your brother and your support. Yes, my brother. Right. No, uh, ah. there is a sister on oh. the side. Yes. Go ahead. Your name? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Is it uh, that you are telling us to speak to the Jewish, to bring them into the da'wah, or to speak to them to give us our right and our uh, fundamental freedom? I think the politicians are doing the job. Individually, we have to learn to talk. Individually. The politicians do their job. Everyone can't be a politician, but everyone can become a da'i according to your capacity. So if everybody starts talking and presenting your case, you disarm the Jew, he sees the anomaly of his position, his, his, his determination to fight you is diminished, and you are achieving your purpose. You're creating more and more friends among them that one day when they start voting, he says, no, he says, now we'll have in Palestine one man, one vote for everybody. It can happen. And in time, you can be the majority there and you can be ruling that country. So to me, talk. Just talk. You know, politics is a different thing altogether. I'm not a politician, but that is, if you learn to talk, you can, you can weaken the man's resistance and determination to fight you. Go ahead, please. Assalamu uh, My name is uh, Mehdeen Dabbah. And my question is, lots of brother Muslims here in the States and abroad and in the Arab countries, they feel that Yasser Arafat is a traitor, which I disagree. Okay? I agree with you totally that we have to talk. The Jews, uh, right 40 years ago up to now, they were saying, the Arabs, they don't want to talk to us. They don't want peace. Okay, it's the time now to sit down and talk to them. My, my question to you, what do you feel about the Muslim Arabs and the Muslims in general that think that Yasser Arafat is a traitor and he should be assassinated? Now, as, as I said again and again, my dear brothers, look, I am not in this political field. Now, this you can carry on, carry on, you kill one another, you have another guy, somebody else kills him. Where will it all end? I says now it is about time that we give this peace process a chance. To me, I say give them a chance, and in the meantime, see what advantage you can get out of that. This is now your Hudaybia. To me, this is your Hudaybia, the Muslims Hudaybia. What our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he did at Hudaybia, you know history. <coughs> treaty, the treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks. What what he did? They started writing the treaty. This is in the name of Allah, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and the Mushrik said, "We don't, we know Allah, but we don't know this Rahman and Rahim. Cut it out." And our Nabi had it cut out. Says so from between Muhammad and Rasulullah and the Quraysh, they said, "Look, we know Muhammad, but we don't know Rasulullah. If had we accepted you as Rasulullah, there would be no problem between us. Cut it out." And Hazrat Ali wouldn't cut it out. So our Nabi Akarim said with his own hands, he had to do that. It's the whole history. You read the history of Hudaybiya, to me, this is our Hudaybiya. This, what is going on now in Palestine is your Hudaybiya. See what mileage we can get out of it. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, please. This is, this is a lecture a process. And the least, least respect we pay to the man who is 75 years old, who came all the way from South Africa, is to be quiet and stop going in and out. The, the sisters here in this corner, to my left hand side, the sister with the hijab, the green hijab. Sister with the green hijab, please sit down and be quiet. Thank you very much. The least we do is to respect whoever is speaking. Thank you very much. Sister, go ahead. Um, hi, my name, assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Sharon, and I just wanted to know if the Muslim leaders are politicians, how come the Muslim religious leaders aren't given a chance um, to have dialect with the Jewish leaders in their countries? I, I, if it's the politicians who are leading, I think that the Muslim religious leaders should be given a chance to have dialogue with the Jewish leaders. Politi po politicians are not. Thank you. I think the Muslims failed. We failed. Mm -hmm. A thousand years. You see, the Jews have been persecuted in Europe by the Christians. Every Easter, the Christians massacred the Jews. They killed their men, they raped their women, they burned their homes. And the Jews fled. Where did they go to? Muslim lands. And the Muslims said, 
Ahlan wa Sahlan. The Arab countries. They said Ahlan wa Sahlan. They came to Morocco. They came to Tunis. They went to Algeria. They went to Egypt. Every Muslim says Ahlan wa Sahlan. You know, we are brothers in Turkey. We are brothers. Ahlan wa Sahlan. Father Abraham, he had two sons. Ismail and Ishaq. You are the children of Ishaq. We are the children of Ismail. We are brothers. Come and live. And in a thousand years, the Muslims, the learned man, now talk about the politicians, the learned man, he didn't do the job. He didn't talk to the Jews. Thousand years, we couldn't convert a thousand Jewish families to Islam. Why? You didn't talk. You are not talking. We didn't talk. The Alims didn't talk. You know, this is the Abani Israel. And you know, I said they are following Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. We follow Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Lakum dinukum wal yadin. Lakum dinukum wal yadin. The Quranic ayahs, the learned man. Lakum dinukum wal yadin. To him, his religion and to me, mine. I said, Allah doesn't say that. Allah doesn't say that. Allah says, call him. Ta'ala. All, all. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmat. Invite all to the ways of the Lord with wisdom. He says, Qul ya ahl al kitab ta'ala. Ta'ala. I'm asking, are you calling them even now? The Christians in Egypt, are you calling them? In the Lebanon, are you calling them? Anyway, the Muslims, are you calling, are you reading the Quran, you understand the Quran, I'm talking about the learned man now, forget the politician. The learned man of all these Muslim universities in the world, are they calling, forget the Jews for a moment now, the Christians, are you calling them? No, I don't know why. You understand the Quran? The Arabs say yes. So Allah is telling you to tell that guy, قُلْ يَا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ Do not go to extremes in your religion. Are you telling them? No. Allah is telling you to tell them, وَلَا تَكُلُوا ثَلَاسَ Don't say Trinity. إِنْ تَهُوا خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ This is stop it, it will be better. Are you telling them? No. I'm talking about the learned man. Forget the politician. The, we have not done the job. We have not spoken. And this is the price we are paying all over in Spain, after ruling 800 years, we are wiped out to a man. Not one man was left in that country to give the azan. We Muslims rule India for a thousand years, and after a thousand years of Muslim rule, when partition takes place, the Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarter. Reason? You didn't do the job. And I'm talking about the alims now. Forget the politicians. The alims didn't do the job, and they're still not prepared to do the job today. My only suggestion is now let the lay people, the ordinary people, you take it up and you open your mouth and you talk. Forget the alims. Let them lead us in salat and deliver khutbah. But you do the job. It's your turn now. It's brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakallah khair, Sheikh Ahmed Yudat. I came from South Africa to here. Uh, my question has two parts actually. The first part is... Uh, uh, when I took a religion class for the Jewish professor, and I asked him after the class, uh, in the Quran, Allah said, uh, And uh, do you believe that Uzair is Ibn Allah? He said, no, it's not true. And the second part is, uh, you said we accept all of the Jewish prophets. So they believe in Joshua and Uzairah and uh, I don't know, some others. Do you, we believe in those? Jazakallah khair. Thank you. As some of the, the Holy Quran mentions by name, we are given some 25 names in the Holy Quran, and I think most of them are Jewish names. There's not a single Arab prophet mentioned in that list, except our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now, I said, we believe, we say all, maybe they said, uh, do they say Joshua is a prophet? I don't know, I don't think so. See, to them they are not prophets. Those they say, look, Dawud alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, Ishaq alayhi salam. These are mentioned in the Quran as prophets. So we accept them, these Jewish prophets as prophets. Isa alayhi salam as a prophet, we accept them. We say, figuratively say, all the Jewish prophets as our prophets and all the heroes as our. This is a manner of speaking. You don't start taking exceptions. Now, what about this guy here? And what about that guy there? Uh, I don't think that's necessary. The thing is now, is general discussion, you talk and you deliver the message. Sister? Um, Sayyid Ahmed Didat, I agree with you and uh, I respect your opinion. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jahad wa kafah wa hawal al mustahil hatta yuqni' al yahud wa nasara. Wa nazalat al ayah al karima wa lan tarda anka al yahud wa lan nasara hatta tattabi'a dhimmatahum. Dhimmatahum. Millatahum. Al kifah. It's not from 1948, it's not from the 1900, 
الكفاح والجهاد من الوقت الذي نزلت به الرسالة since the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Muslims are fighting and struggling and they are and trying their best من من زمن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم هذا استمرار للكفاح والجهاد الذي نحن به الآن. She is saying that she agrees with him and she respects his opinion. And she's also agreeing, she's saying that this jihad or, or this struggle has been going on since the beginning of the da'wah of the Prophet وسلم, and it will continue on inshallah. It will continue inshallah. Thank, inshallah. Thank you very much. And the victory wal-Arab. will be for the Muslims who happen to be Arabs and Indonesians and so on. I'm editing, editing a little inshallah. bit. Good. Thank you very much. Anna. And, and then anna. she's quoting the verse from the Holy Quran that the Jews and the Christians will never accept you until you follow their own ways and means. And it is our struggle to convert them to our own ways and means, inshallah. And it is the duty of each and every one here. Okay? Thank you. Next, uh, next question. I, I, thought, uh, I thought it was a comment. It was not a question. It was a comment, really. Right, sister? Where is the sister? It was a comment. Yeah, she says the same. So, thank you. The brother? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yusuf al-Madhoon from Denver, Colorado. Uh, Brother Ahmed Didat, uh, many of the Muslim scholars, they quote the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in saying, the day of judgment will not come until the Muslims fight with the Jews. What is your elaboration on this? This is not my field, my brother. What my field is, is the field of Dawah, and it is the bounden duty of every Muslim at every given time to do the job. You can't close shop and say, now this guy won't accept and that guy won't accept. With regards to the ayah, it says, tarda ankal yahudu nasara hatta That is the statement of fact. Now what do you do about it? What do you do? You want to put up a fight? You want to fight? And you want to kill one another? Because they won't accept? Then don't talk. You're not going to talk. Is that what Allah tells you not to talk? He's telling you, Ya Ahlul Kitab Ta'ala. Are you calling that? He said, no, no, they, they won't be satisfied. They won't be satisfied. You have to find ways and means of getting to them. And Allah is teaching you in the Quran how to get at these people. But we have stopped doing the job. We lost the art. Okay. Go ahead. alaikum. Uh, Mr. Didat, my question to you specifically, um, what is the role of the woman in this dialogue in Islam? Because the woman is always in current generations been suppressed, set to the side, pushed away in a corner and pigeonholed when in the actuality of Islam, if you look back in the history of Islam, the women even went on the wars with the men. They even, uh, were, the men even listened to the women in Islam. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala ta'ala anha was one of the greatest voices of Islam. And right now, if you look at the congregation of men standing there to speak and you look at the women standing here to speak, you can see the difference about how the women in Islam have been suppressed. I am not saying that the woman has to be out there and carry on the man's role. What I'm saying is that she has her own role and her position and her place in Islam. And I don't think that it is being fulfilled currently. And I'm asking you, what is your opinion and your view on this subject? Thank you. Jazakallah, my daughter. To me, my sister, my daughter. Yes. To me, we need our sisters. We need your, your, your help. So far, the Muslim has been fighting with one hand. We had to fight with two hands. And the need for Muslim women to get involved became most apparent to me when I was in Saudi Arabia. I went to Jubei, the industrial city. And the Imam of that masjid, he was my host. And he's taking me to the masjid and bringing me back to his home. Then on the way he's asking me, he says, Mr. D. Dad, we had converted so many whites, Americans and Germans and French to Islam. And after some time they all revert again to Christianity. They become murtads. And he wanted to know from me, why? Why are they becoming murtads? I said, that is the question I should be asking you. You converted the people, how do they become murtas again? But I can hazard a guess. I said, you see, these people when they come to your house, what do you do? You welcome them in the sitting room, in the lounge. You sit at the gentleman and you talk. His wife comes along, what do you do? Send her to the kitchen. You send the wife to the kitchen. So your wife, and your poor wife, she can't speak English. So the only thing she can do is, whatever she's got the cookies, they says, Tam, eat. Eat akala, akala, 
You know, eat, eat this. This is very nice. This is the only thing that your poor wife can do. Now, you talk to him, chat with this guy and he likes your explanation. He accepts Islam. But now, at home, the wife is crying. She is going to church. Sunday with the children, she is going to church. So what has the Arabs done to you? What have they been feeding you? What drugs have they been giving you? So, the thing is this now, you are not catering for the women. And that you have to do is, you have to cater, as well as you cater for the man, you have to cater for the woman. And for that, you my sisters, you have to do the job. You must get involved. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, the last question will be the brother in the leather jacket. Please go ahead and take a seat. Thank you very much. There's no bargaining. There's no bargaining. I don't bargain. You should have told us from Th before. I made a mistake. I apologize. Please sit down. You have to fix it. Thank you very much. You should have fixed it. And uh, the brother in the leather jacket, and that's it. Please, let us respect the procedures, and I would appreciate it very much. You should not said it from before. It Thank you for telling me. Thank you for telling me. You appreciate have to fix it now. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Please sit down. We have to, we have to voice our, our sound. Thank, no, no, no. Please. Just one, 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 just one extra. No, no. One extra person. No. Might be someone has good information. I didn't ask you to speak, brother. Brother, thank you very much. Brother. If you really believe in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, please sit down. I will get a security person to get you out. I am telling you, go and sit down. If you do it, it's your problem. Thank you very much. Go and sit one, down. One minute. You should be flexible. Brother, go ahead with your question and he's going to be sitting down. Thank Assalamu you. alaikum. My name is Brother Shah Nawaz Khan. Uh, I'm going to talk about copyright. I'm, I'm going to use the copyright word which you have said. Uh, we all know that technology is not a copyright for the Christians and Muslims. I mean, Christians and Jews. Where do you think the Muslims miss the boat on technological advancement? A second part of that is, what happened to Ishtihad after our four great IMAs? I think, my brother, you are the best person to supply answers to all that. Look, you heard me talking, and the things that I was talking on a different level, to about technology and all that, you are in the field of technology, you must go and educate the people in this field that you are an expert and master in. I am an expert in the field of Dawah, and I'm telling you how to do Dawah. I will teach you, tell, ask me how to talk to the Jew, how to talk to the Christian, then I will teach you. You want to know about everything else in the world, about politics, about technology and all that? I said, my brother, you are a better person for that type of a job than myself. What do you think of Ishtihad in Islam? You are a better man to answer all that. Okay, have a seat. Okay, the last question with the sister, and then the brother has to sit down and relax. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Uh, welcome to the United States. I've been listening to you all evening, and partly this afternoon, and you've confirmed my faith in Islam, and I wanted to tell you, I've talked to people, women especially, from all over the world, and your name is always mentioned. So thank you very much. Uh, you have answered my questions while I have been standing here. Thank you. Just, just, just Allah bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.